us. You will appreciate what she has. She brings a wealth of information, and she brings a wealth of, uh, uh, of experience to this topic she's going to talk about. She's an American syndicate columnist, columnist, author, and conservative political activist. Parker is one of the names on the short list mentioned when anyone speaks of national black conservative leaders. She is the founder and president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, a public policy think tank that promotes market-based solutions to fight poverty. Before her involvement in social activism, Starr has seven years of hand, first-hand experience in the grip of welfare dependency. After consulting on welfare reform in the mid-90s, she founded Urban, Care, Urban Cure to bring new ideas of policy discussion on how to transition Americans poor from government dependency. Without further ado, if we welcome Starr to the stage. Glad you're here, Starr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I have to go up here because I brought notes. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've actually gone to about 220, maybe 230 colleges in the country, and it's nice and welcoming when I go to a state uh, where they believe in God and guns, and, um, and I don't have to fight my way through. I'll have armed security with me to, uh, to come and just share a few of the things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, today. You know, one of the things that was missing in that bio, this is why I really don't like the Wikipedia, because you got to constantly go in there and tell them the truth, because there's always somebody in there that just wants to go and distort uh, the, the reality. The reality is that between the, I had seven years of in and out experience in the welfare state, and then consulting on welfare reform, that life happened between there. Uh, after uh, believing a lot of lies of the left, I told this to the Folks I was talking to earlier that wanted to ask me a few questions but didn't know I was, so we had to kind of get that thing started. Uh, as I told them that uh, one of the reasons that my life got so lost is because I believe the lie of the left, a lot of lies of the left. Uh, one of the challenges we have in our society today is that because you just kind of believe all the lies of the left. And so I believe that my problems were somebody else's fault. I believe that... Um, that, that America was so racist I didn't have to mainstream. I believe that poor people were poor because wealthy people were wealthy because that's what I heard all my life. And so I began uh, down a path of just reckless living. I'm just going to live for today and do whatever I'm asked to do. And so I was asked to do a whole lot of stuff uh, from a very, very young age, uh, things from criminal activity to drug activity to sexual activity that landed me in and out of abortion clinic after clinic. That wasn't your cell phone, was it? Because I knew you were looking for your cell phone earlier. Did you have the cell phone? Did you have your cell phone? Oh, okay. She was looking for her cell phone early. <laughs> She's like, it's in my backpack but backpacks way over there but anyway it was um but so so I'm just like living this very reckless life um, I was in and out of abortion clinic after clinic after the fourth time I just had a gut instinct way down deep inside that there must be something wrong with killing your offspring you know maybe feminists didn't have this exactly right uh, but I hadn't changed any of my sexual patterns so I was pregnant again within a very short period of time um, pretty appreciative of the fact that I could at least narrow down to two who the father of the child was and that's how I ended up in welfare and on welfare three and a half years consistently watching my life go into a little dark hole so I'm telling you all that because the line that's missing in that bio between you know the seven and a half years in and out of welfare and consulting on federal welfare Firm, uh, uh, welfare reform was a Christian conversion that changed my life. A Christian conversion that changed my life. It was really fascinating for me because I didn't know that I was on a path to a Christian conversion. I thought I was going into a business in South Central LA to subsidize my welfare check uh, because the rules of welfare, Uncle Sam with his pitiful self, uh, has these rules to keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation. Don't work, don't save, don't get married. And as a result of not doing those things, your life can unravel and go into a little dark hole. Uh, but um, I wanted a little bit more, so I went into this business in South Central LA to get them to give me a little cash that I did not have to report to the government. And the people I met there said they didn't pay like that, that they were legitimate businessmen. So of course I started confronting them because these brothers were good looking. I figured I could party all day working with them, I could party all night. Uh, but they um, began to challenge my life and I began to tell more of my life and then I began to challenge them uh, and why they would mainstream in a country with the history that they had against our people. Uh, and they told me that they were legitimate businessmen and that I could believe any of the lies that I wanted to, uh, but that um, I couldn't work there. Uh, and one of the main reasons is because of my lifestyle. And so I wanted to know, well, what was wrong with my lifestyle? And they said, it's unacceptable. And I'm unacceptable, that's a hate crime. You can't say that word in today's society. Unacceptable to who? And they said, God. And I hadn't heard the word God. You know, you guys are so fortunate to be in a Christian school. I hope half of you are Christians at least. You could be here because your mom and dad is doing the Moses thing and they just kind of um, put you in the river and hope that, you know, you're a proper one. And well, she, she didn't know what was gonna happen to him. 
She just said, if you look at the scripture, this one's proper. He's not going the way of the others and just kind of drifted them on off. And so I don't know, that might be one reason to rescue you and put you off in a Christian school. I don't know, you might be here by choice because you really love the Lord and I want to grow in him. But some of us just never heard of it. In fact, when they said God, I, whew, I, it, it resonated for some reason. I hadn't heard God with a capital G. Uh, so I got out of there. I wish I could tell you that, you know, I got a little Baptist guilt and fell on my face right then, but I didn't know any Baptists either. So I just got out of there. I, for the first time, started actually thinking about the things I had done in my life, the breaking and entering, the armed robbery, the men. But then I started thinking, too, about this God because they kept calling me, wanting me to go to church with them. Come go to church with us. I hadn't been in a church. And I'm starting to think, why? Why would I want to do that? And so they kept calling me and wanting me to go to their church. Had I known some lawyers from the ACLU, I would have sued them for religious harassment. And I would have won. But I didn't know any lawyers then. I know a lot of lawyers now because I work in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it's full of lawyers. It, they remind me of the people I used to hang out on the street corner with, actually. Uh, that's why we're out there draining the swamp. But, um, yeah, that's why I wrote my first book. My first book is called Pimps, Whores, and Welfare Brats. And uh, yeah, I left a lot of details out, though, because of the statutes of limitations. It's my autobiography, and I didn't want to end up in jail. Uh, so just to give you a little glimpse into my life. But I didn't know any lawyers then, so I decided to go to church with them one day. And I heard what some of you may have heard and taken seriously. Some of you may just let it go in passing. Um, and some of you might hear it for the first time today. And I heard that God was in Christ. I heard the gospel. I heard that he was reconciling the world to himself. I heard that he wasn't counting my sin against me. I hadn't even thought about sin. I heard that he loved me, he died for me, and wanted me to be free. I mean, this is like incredible news. So when the preacher said, come down, if you want to get saved, I didn't know what I was being saved from or to, so I went on down there. And the next thing you know, my life started feeling better and I started changing. And then I did what a lot of folks do when they've heard about the gospel and how much God loves them for the first time, that they start wanting to soak it up. You know, like the testimony we heard this morning, she had born, she had born in it, but when she was born again in it, she started soaking it up. And you start hearing truth, and you start recognizing it. It starts getting in your soul, and it starts getting in your spirit, and then you want more of it, and I wanted more of it, and I kept going and going and going. And then God started changing me more and changing me more. And he started changing the reality for my kid who I used to live at home uh, and tell her, don't open the door and don't answer the phone. I'll be right back. And, well, she was two years old. She couldn't answer the phone or the door anyway and stumble in maybe in the middle of the night with some guy. Um, but all of that was changing now. And then one day, years into it, uh, that preacher looked out at about 4,000 people and pointed his finger and said, what are you doing living on welfare? I'm like, who, me? How does he know I live on welfare? Because I had done what a lot of people do when they get saved in church. I became a couch Christian, and I just kind of like did the semantics of what we're supposed to do, tithing and offering, and who's not supposed to judge anything else uh, in, in my life. And I'm thinking, how does he know? Maybe it's because of that time I sent him food stamps when he said give. They sent him back. They said the church didn't take food stamps. So he said, the government is not your source. So I'm thinking while he's talking, what do you mean the government's not my source? Welfare checks based on what my ancestors went through. Yes, it is. He said, you have a decision to make today. It's God or government. I'm sitting there. God or government. And he said, open your Bible. And someone had given me a Bible. How many of you have a Bible? You don't got Bibles? Yeah, it's not a Christian college. I'm kind of glad I didn't need a security guard to come in here today. And I won't have to worry about getting out of here like I had. For some, when I did Emory, man, they had to change my hotel three times. <laughs> oh, Lord, just so I can get a good night's sleep and get up out of there. Um, they'd give me a Bible. And he said, turn your Bible to Philippians 4.19. So I turned over to Philippians 4.19. And then we read it together. And my God will supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I'm thinking, his God is going to supply my need? I mean, he's a preacher, okay? He surely knows God. I mean, he's standing up there. He, I mean, there are some preachers in this society I've met since then that I just wonder about them. I, I'm, I'm glad they're not calling themselves churches. They call themselves centers because you do have to wonder what the, if they're reading the same Bible I'm reading. But this particular person, he was reading the Bible every Sunday and every Tuesday night when I would go to Bible study, and he's reading it with me in, in the Bible. So I'm starting to think about his God, creator of heaven and earth. 
The God of, of miracles is why I, I love traveling so much. I can't sit still. My dad was in the Air Force, and I think I got the bug. I'm the middle child. I'm left hand. I got it all. I got the left-handed part. I got the Sag part. I got the, 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 the black part, the female part, the woo, can't sit still part. So I just love being up in the air. So lately, I've been taking pictures so that my grandson, who's 12 years old now, can try to find stuff with me. Like I sent him one over Washington. I said, find the monument and the Lincoln Memorial. Found it. So I'm like, OK. Let me find something harder. So when I flew up out of California where I live, uh, I, I saw the pier in San Clemente, and I saw over the curve, and I saw the water tower, and I took a picture of it and said, now find grandmommy's house, and uh, I haven't heard from him. So, uh, and it, coming out this way, I had to fly up over Catalina Island, and so I sent him the picture. I said, now find God. So I figured that he'll write back soon to say, I found him because the whole thing is the Lord, because he loves the Lord even at his young age. So that God, creator of heaven and earth, you know, I know that the Lord is under attack all over our society. That's why I'm hoping that some of you really are Moses. I'm hoping that some of you are taking your Christianity seriously enough to say that although I'm seeking a college degree and a profession, that God is going to show me the vision for my life and what it is that I can do in my purpose. Uh, because we need some activists for sure. And may maybe some of you will uh, be called to do that kind of work because they're moving God's symbols everywhere they can. He's under lawsuit. Uh, in, in, in our society in a variety of areas. You know, and I think that the politicians are behind moving a whole lot of the symbols because when you get to Washington, symbols are everywhere. I mean, the founders of the country really did, many of them, know God and they knew and they spoke into how it won't work, guys. This experiment will not work if you're not a moral people. And in order to be a moral people, you gotta be a religious people. And the religious people that they were talking about was that Judeo-Christian heritage, the God of the Bible. And so I think the politicians are behind it because God's everywhere out there. I was telling somebody earlier, I, one of the reasons that we, I know California will be safe, even though, you know, we have issues, um, some issues, but we'll be safe because in the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, uh, everybody gets a statue. Well, our statue is a saint, St. Junipero Serra. So where sin abounds, grace much more. So we will not be falling off into ocean. So no, you guys will not have oceanfront uh, over time, as many people are just cursing and thinking that we're going to just kind of go away. But I really just think, because if you go, these politicians, if you go up into the, the, uh, the, the chamber of the Congress, they have all the philosophers of the world with their little heads turned sideways, except Moses. He's looking right at those liars. So I just think. <laughs> They are wanting Moses removed. But it would be very difficult to convince the rest of society, yes, we're taking Moses down, has nothing to do with his looking at us and doesn't want to steal it. And everybody, every time somebody asks me, are you going to ever run for politics? I'm like, I used to steal, lie, and cheat for a living. I told the Lord I would not do that anymore. I can't go into the political. I'm sorry. But you know, there are some symbols that they just can't remove. They can take Moses. They can take that little cross. They can go, oh, but there's some you can't. And I took pictures. And so I'm sitting there listening to this preacher that his God, because the Bible says my God will supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I'm comparing his God to my welfare, $430 a month, a couple hundred food stamps, and a Medicare card. And so I wrote my caseworker and said, take my name off. I'm trusting God. Now, I didn't know that the, the, so how many of you are studying sociology? <laughs> so you get to do it here in a Christian school. Then the secular schools, they teach them that, no, 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 don't you read something that says, I'm trusting God without calling him, cursing him out, because she sure did. She called and cursed me out and told me I'd be back. And I was determined I'm not going back. So that means now, because I just got rid of my entitlement based on what my ancestors went through, I had to go do what everybody has to do when they um, burn all the bridges in their life. I had to go get a job. Yeah. I wish I could tell you that God just put a money tree in my yard after I left welfare. And um, uh, even if he did, it wasn't my yard. I was on welfare. It was your parents' yard. Uh, and I promised there was, no, there was no money tree there. So I had to go get a job. I had a mainstream. And I could hear going in there to get that little job in the back of my mind what I had been told all my life, getting to the questions that we're discussing in this conference, ethnicity and identity. I had just found out over the last three years going to this church on a real regular basis that my life was hid in Christ, that I'm his. I'm uniquely made, but I'm a new creature. I'm born again. I have my own identity now. But I'm going in to get this little job, and I can hear in the back of my mind what I've been told all my life by people who said they represented me because they wore the same color skin I wore. And that was that white people won't hire black people unless the government makes them. 
all the representatives, just a constant narrative that all the cards are always stacked and always will be stacked against you because of the history of this country. I could hear it in my mind. I just got in there, I needed a job so desperately. I was so glad it was a little white guy. And I was glad because I figured I'll beat him up if he doesn't hire me because I'm getting desperate. And I'd already heard the scriptures that, you know, God, you know, I can, be, I can, I can repent on Sunday. Uh, but I didn't have to beat him up because it wasn't true. It was a lie that white people won't hire black people unless the government makes them. Because that guy hired me and he didn't hire me because I was black. He hired me because he needed somebody that could pen things correctly. He needed someone that knew how to write because I was gonna be taking orders in the basement of a food distribution company. You know, when we were um, working on federal welfare reform, I was um, uh, one of the consultants on federal welfare reform in the 90s, and I would have to debate people that would come in there that just knew so much more about the system, and they would tell me things like, well, you know, if the alternative to trapping these poor people into these ghettos and, 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 and throwing away the keys and sending their children off to jail or to fail in schools, the alternative is they're gonna to have to go work for McDonald's. And so I have to tell them, well, you know, actually, McDonald's wouldn't have hired me at that point in my life because they had cash registers, and I needed to prove myself before anybody should have put me near one um, because everybody just seemed to know much better for what somebody else's life should be about when you look at them from a one-size-fits-all state, uh, which we all know doesn't. One size just doesn't fit all. I, I tried to get in the jeans from 40 years ago. It's, my own jeans don't fit all, okay? <laughs> What we have done to the poor in this country is what I'm gonna talk about. Because at this point, not only did he hire me, God used that man to teach me the principles of distribution. It was that man that taught me the principles of God's system and order when it comes to the distribution of talents. That we are not all the same that there's no way that you should be able to look at someone and then sum up their whole lives for them and then try to micromanage law that fits them in these special interest boxes because it's not only unfair to that person, it's not fair to the people that are listening and looking in on this that may want to befriend that person. No, it was on that job that God showed me that he may have given some five, some two, he gave me one. Because that little white guy walked by my desk one day and said, you sure talk a lot. He said, have you ever considered sales and marketing? I didn't know what he was talking about, but I can attest to I got a degree in marketing and figured it out. That if I could sell for him, I could sell for myself. And I went into my own business. And I grew that business over the next eight years, watching the hand of the Lord. Not looking at me because I was African American. But looking at me because I was uniquely made in his image with specific talents and gifts. And it, during the 1992 Los Angeles riots, uh, the Rodney King riots, some of you might know, some of you too young, might have read about it in the history book. Um, my business was destroyed, but I wasn't going back to welfare because I'd seen the hand of God in my uniqueness. I'd seen what he will do if somebody just says, you know, I'm going to set aside all these other identifications that the, that the society wants to put on me. Even sometimes even your parents want to put on you. Everybody wants to label you and put you in some special group outside of the uniqueness that God has made you to discover what it is that he wants and to spend your whole life looking for that discovery. And boy, I tell you, it can be a roller coaster. He'll teach us a variety of different things. We have just heard testimony of a family that knew they were Christian and did everything that they could to raise their children in Christianity and one struggled and said, but I'm good and lost and became the lost sheep. Then the Lord went and found it. The Lord, that story is serious. And he went to find that one. And I think about, well, what happened to the other ones while he was out finding them? They were sitting there thinking, well, if he went to find that one, he'll find us too. And in that story, her parents found redemption and found a whole nother level of Christ. That's what the Lord does when we take away all of this other stuff and peel back to say, but I'm, I'm me, I, I, I can't be, you know, every time somebody asks me about all the racial challenges all over the country, I'm like, uh, seek and you shall find. I'm not looking for racism, so hey, 
No, I cannot say it's touching my life every day. I live in California. But in that moment, everything is destroyed. So I had an opportunity to go with the narrative, which was, oh, see, can't do anything out there because they'll hunt you down. Racism, come get you. Burn down the city and everybody loses everything. No, I wasn't going back to welfare because I can remember depositing more money in a week than the welfare has sent me in a year. Instead of going out with everybody else that was going and running to Washington, D.C., we need more laws. We need more government. We need more. I decided to say, well, Lord, what is it that you have me to do? And he led me down another path, and I went into the talk radio for a little while and um, ended up working for ABC. Boy, whew, they didn't like what I was talking about. They, um, actually, there were two things going on wrong there. One, it was a three-hour radio show, and I talk a lot. As I said, I took my one little talent and went on over there, but um, they, they wanted me to take phone calls. I didn't want to take phone calls. I wanted to talk. So that was already an issue between me and my management. But number two, they didn't like what I was talking about because there were a whole bunch of liberals, and I wasn't liberal at that point because I didn't realize, hey, I didn't even know the terms liberal and conservative. When they called me a conservative, I had to look it up. I was a Christian, but I looked it up and I thought, well, okay, I may as well be that because I'm not going to allow people to identify me based on whatever they think that that word means because there again, identity label. They tell you, you're a conservative. And they know that when they say that, that means that now a whole lot of people are not gonna wanna hear what you have to say because they think that you're so different and then they've already defined what that meant. So when they would say it, I would just say, thank you. You know, they would call me an Uncle Tom. I would say, thank you, I actually read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and I, I appreciate that. That's actually a compliment. And God moved me through that radio experience. They finally, they finally fired me, but I wasn't going back to welfare. Because now I'm giving away more money in a year. Giving away more money in a year than the welfare had sent me the whole seven years I was in and out. That's what the hand of the Lord will do. If you trust him, turn your life over to him and get out of the other identities and uh, special interest groups that others with agendas try to put us in. And I had already now been exposed to quite a bit of political talk because I, my business was publishing a magazine and I was talking about these issues uh, on radio. And most of them were just Christian issues in my opinion, but they had been politicized. Education, housing, welfare, uh, abortion, many of the issues that we're confronted with today, poverty, that I knew in journeying with the Lord that it was time for me to maybe do something about that. And that's how I ended up consulting on federal welfare reform. And after consulting on federal welfare reform, we had just changed the reality of five million women and nine million children and no one knew what we were doing because the Congressional Black Caucus was so insistent that they like identity politics. So they were not going to go and let these women know that there was hope for them, that we could restore their dignity, that we had just op we had stopped a cancer. And now it's time for them to go through the rehabilitation stage and get out there and mainstream their lives and get comfortable with their uniqueness. No, instead they went and lied on us and told them all these negatives, so I decided then that it's time to get more engaged and get engaged with the community itself. People needed to know what had just happened through federal welfare reform in the 90s. I knew those girls would be scared, especially after I did the Oprah Winfrey show, and she looked in that camera and said, what you guys are doing is gonna have women starving or children starving and women thrown to the street. And I'm like, those girls are gonna be scared. So I said, I gotta do something. So I had a conference. I said, I'm just gonna do a conference and invite pastors in my local community at Los Angeles. And I did, I had a conference and I thought, okay, life after welfare, what you gonna do now? This is before the internet, so I had to do this whole big old, you know, marketing campaign, just drop some information at all the churches there. Life after welfare, what you gonna do now? Pastors only, come to the hotel at this time. And so we prepared thinking about 40 pastors would come, maybe, maybe four, and 400 showed up. And that's when I knew it's not that they don't want to engage in what has happened and broken down in our most hard hit vulnerable communities, but they just didn't know how to. They didn't know what had broken down and how to fix it. So what I wanna talk to you about is how to fix what is broken down so that we can heal ourselves on these matters of ethnicity, economics, and um, identity politics. Because we have now a president in town who wants to fix what is broken down in our most vulnerable and distressed zip codes. And we have a window of opportunity to help them get this done. And it should be done, whether you like them or not. Because all of the social snapshots and all of the financial forecasts today show us 
that having a very large, chronically poor portion of our population is not healthy for the individuals, it's not healthy for us as a country, it's certainly uh, driving discourse and division when it comes to ethnicity, economics, and identity politics on a local level, on a state level, and on a federal level. Today, I run a policy institute in Washington, D.C. In fact, my work is twofold. I, do, um, I, I write a syndicated column for creators, which in and of itself is pretty fascinating, considering I graduated high school barely literate and probably couldn't even read that diploma they had given me, which they probably shouldn't have given me, but they wanted me to get out of there and as quickly as possible, so just go. Um, but I write a syndicated column, so it runs all over the country. Probably, some say the estimated readership's about 8 million. Uh, and in that, it avails me to a whole lot of media. And so I'll have media people come out that watch Fox News, especially if they, you know, my column people see me in a little box, and then they come out and they say, well, you're so much prettier in person. I say, oh, thank you. And uh, they want to hear me. And then the, my Foxaholics come out, and they want to hear me too. And then they, oh, you're prettier in person. I'm like, yeah, right. Uh, Fox sprays us with makeup. I know that's not true. And in fact, when I do the Varney show in the morning, Fox and friends, I go immediately to my apartment in D.C. and get that makeup off because I don't want people to think I'm going back to my old lifestyle. You know, I'm just, I'm just coming in from the night before, you know, so I just like, okay, let's get out of here. So I get that. I get that part of my life, and I appreciate that part of my life. But on the other part of my life, my full time is that I actually started a policy institute. And I started a policy institute that, uh, that speaks in the culture, race, and poverty issues because, um, because it, my side, the red team had grown accustomed to just talking about everything that we're doing wrong. And I didn't see much emphasis on saying, well, okay, so if we had a perfect world, what would we do right? What, what, what is it that we should be doing on behalf of those that are on the margins, that are in our distress zip codes, that, are, that are, uh, are treated unfairly? And so as a result of that, uh, you know, I, I, it's a think tank, so I have to look at data. Uh, and so I, I look at income and demographic data of all the states across the country. Everywhere. I, I look at the poverty rates based on race and age and family structure. I look at the education rates based on age, race, and family structure. I look at the crime rates based on race, age, family structure. If you want to know, did I look up this? Yes. And whatever I find all over the country, everywhere I go, regarding those that are most unprepared to mainstream, those that now others have demagogued and say that they're speaking on behalf and constantly have an, our society in this constant struggle for our identity, ourselves, as Americans, those common points where we might touch. What I find from those that are most unprepared to mainstream, whether I'm urban, rural, native, suburban, all the data, north, south, east, west, point to the exact same thing, the breakdown. Not only the ethnic, et economic, and identity uh, challenges that are facing our country, but also those, uh, the, 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 those that are uh, afflicted by poverty, whether it's economic po poverty or just bankrupt of their, of, of their resources to be able to grab their own lives. They're a direct result. These challenges are a direct result of two things. Collapsed ethics, our worldview, and collapsed marriage. It's not an accident that we've become more racially conscious and economically divided than was the case that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. attempted to take us to a place where he wanted us to go by getting the Civil Rights Act passed into law. Dr. King was a Baptist preacher whose movement was about repentance and revival. And it's really fascinating we have to talk about that in particular in Black History Month because people have forgotten. They've not forgotten uh, or, or, or just you know, on the surface, they're rewriting history to forget. You can't even go to his memorial in Washington DC and see that he was a Baptist preacher. They forgot to mention that. And in fact, if you read all of the signs around his memorial in Washington, D.C., you would think that he was a community organizer whose major mission was to demilitarize the country because of the Vietnam War. I mean, those are the kind of quotes that they decided to put there. No, he was a Baptist preacher whose movement was about repentance and revival. But his predecessors, those that came after him, those that we're dealing with today, their movement was then and still is about revenge and redistribution. Today, most black leaders of the 60s and the 70s are a major part of the hard progressive left, which together they've declared war on our fundamental core principles of this society. That that made us who we are, that you're getting entrusted to take into the next generation. 
They've declared war on Christianity, capitalism, and our Constitution. The left's answer to every concern, every crisis, every conflict has been exactly the same. Poor government money at it. So now today we have government schools, government health care, government housing, government welfare, government wage laws, government retire, all of which have exacerbated the conditions of despair, causing government dependency to spread like a cancer through our whole union. Because the lack of marriage equals lack of family. Lack of family equals lack of tradition, the ethics. Lack of ethics and or tradition equals lack of education. Lack of education equals lack of a work ethic and lack of a work ethic means a lack of a vision. And for those that know the scripture, you know that without a vision, people get lost. One translator says crime runs rampant. We're very lost. It's very easy for me to get lost. And people ask, how did you get so lost? It's easy to get lost. You know, King, King Solomon told us a couple of, he didn't repeat himself often in the Proverbs, but he did say twice, don't move these landmarks. You'll get lost. I bet you when the Lord went to find that one little sheep, he didn't leave the mother sheep just roaming off. There was a fence around them. People get lost. Every discipline, you know from your classes, every single discipline, we know that there are rules to govern that discipline. Whether you're studying science or math, Music or art, there are rules to govern that discipline. But when it came to life, oh no, we as a society figure, oh no, 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 there are no rules to govern this life. We'll figure it out on our own. So we scrubbed our schools from all reference to God. Well, well what do you do when you, when you don't know what to do? You look outside and see what everybody else is doing. Well, what's everybody doing? I mean, you can tell that just the way we all dress the same, you know? We look outside, what's everybody else doing? Well, everybody's doing pop culture. And there are schools where we're doing secular humanism. And in our workplace, we're doing moral relativism. Or at least we were. Until now, we're under such attack that they're getting ready to put up some real barriers to Christianity because you won't be doing moral relativism at all. You will be doing what the state says you're able to do. And the state's getting real close to saying, and there will be no Bibles in the public square. So in order to find answers to today's problems, we've got to ask ourselves, how did we get here? What happened that we got so off course? What happened that now half the country does not believe in eternal truths? Half the country. You're going to leave out of school, and if you, don't, and if you uh, venture away from this quiet community that somebody said is probably the reddest dot in the state and maybe even the union, you're going to find out that half the country does not believe in eternal truths. How did you get to the place where the polling just came out uh, from uh, 2017 they told us we have equal number of nuns than we do even Protestants or Christian. And I don't mean nuns, N-U-N-S. I mean nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Nothing. How, how do we get there? How, 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 choice loses its meaning if it doesn't matter what you choose. So how do we get to the place where nobody cares what anybody chooses anymore? Half the country doesn't believe in a limited role of government. The government is the protector interest, not to plunder us, not to pursue us. Half the country does not believe in open and free markets. How in the world do we have such a disdain from capitalism when profit is so good? Profit gives us the engine for tomorrow. Profit not only helps create the jobs that we say that we want, but profit is how people give money away to the charities that we need. How is it that we got to the place where no one, half the country doesn't even believe any pluribus unum? Who's, who's actually been to the Statue of Liberty? to see that grand monument that says, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your wretched. And what, would that, what was the meaning of all of that? It was so many would become one. And now we're so multicultural and so diverse that we're, we're just in and everything that you want to choose to be in, and nobody is going to say anything about it unless, of course, you choose to be a Christian. So you have to say, what happened? How did we get here? Well, welcome to the 60s. We had three wars on our culture. One, that's war of religion. Opened the door to this culture of meaninglessness. It, nothing matters. And this is not a good place to be. When you poll a society and less than 11% trust the people making their laws, it's not healthy. And people always complain about, well, they got too many lobbyists in Washington. That's why I hate Washington. I'm like, oh, you just haven't had to hire one yet. Uh, yeah, everybody that has something has a lobbyist. You're doing right about that. It's kind of like a doctor. Nobody wants to go to one, but then when you need them, or a lawyer. 
What else happened in the 60s? Well, we had a war on marriage, the feminist movement, and it weakened women, and it opened the door to this culture of materialism. We're starting to hear a whole lot about it lately in the news because as, the, as the, um, the, 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 the Hollywood is so bent on getting rid of Pharaoh that, uh, that they're exposing themselves. I was asked by the media about, well, gosh, what do you think about all this unraveling, all this, you know, um, me too. I said, oh, that used to be what you would do in the church. You go down and confess your sins, but they want to confess it on the internet. That's fine. Yeah, that's where they want to do it. But after two generations of this sexual revolution, marriage has totally collapsed. That's what's happened to us as a society. You want to know why we're so divided right now? Marriage has collapsed. Marriage rates dropped from 75% of the adult population in the 70s to 45% today. And for blacks, it dropped in half from the 70s to 30% today. 30% African American uh, adults are married in our society. And this is a big challenge. It's a big challenge for this community because marriage is the social stabilizer. Because in marriage, we create family, and in family, we pass tradition. Traditions like, yes, you are getting up and going to school, and you better, because I'm getting ready to call your dad in here if you don't. Conjugal marriage is the capstone of all humanity, and as a result of its unraveling, our public square now is in total chaos. And a whole lot of people, especially Christians, are timid by this. They don't know what to say or what to do. Homosexuality and monism are dividing us, and for those of you that don't know what monism is, look it up. Because we're right up against it right now. Monism is the elimination of gender identity. It's the elimination. It is it's a direct attack on the creator that says, I made them male, female. Monism says, you didn't make us at all. And a whole lot of people, they get lost in it, as we heard testament this morning. It's a lure into things that can confuse you over time. And now it's bringing into question homosexuality in the public square, monism, that the very premise of personal responsibility and them and the government are under attack. Abortion has deeply hurt us, questioning the very premise of humanity and the 14th Amendment protections. 68 million dead in 44 years should give us all great pause. 68 million dead? That's your generation, just missing. That's why we have um, movements in the, what they call pro-life community, I call them anti-abortion community, called survivors. Because if you were born after 73, boy, God just has a real hand on you. And I hope you don't squander it on something that he wouldn't desire because you were protected by him. I mean, when we look at what was happening, and now we can see in the clinics, we, God's nail's real, we saw him. We know what he was doing in that, in that abortion clinic. Planned Parenthood is real. We see them. We know that they're selling baby parts. They can pretend that they're not human. Then how did they have a liver that you put a price on it? The third thing that happened during those 60s is the war on poverty. A weakened family and open disorder is culture of entitlement, victimization, and identity politics. They left this whole concept of redistribution of wealth. But that's their mantra. Redistribute wealth. Really? Uh, it, it's not only inconsistent with the scripture, because the 10th commandment says, don't covet. And believe you me, socialism is rooted in covetousness. Somebody has something somebody else doesn't have, so we go hire politicians to take it from them. It's theft. It also violates private property. You know, I mentioned that about the gun because my granddad never met the man, but um, I heard he had an edict. He was one generation out of slavery. And he taught his family, if you want us to stay free, you need two things, property and a gun. And um, we kept a whole lot of that property. It's an absolute principle of freedom, private property. But wealth redistribution takes people's private property, but the bigger damage that it does under the guise of social justice is it breaks down the very social structure one really needs to excel because it steals their humanity. It takes away their dignity and their worth because now they're in a special interest category that some politician will determine their future. Today, far too many people are now lost in this, without a moral code of ethics, without a rule of law. And our society, because of it, has reduced itself to collectivism and now political correctness. I got lost, as I told you all, and I, I just thank God every day for my Christian conversion, because it's deeply meaningful to, get, to wake you up and we have a whole lot of work to do to wake up others if we're going to help ourselves to a healthy society. Because the nuclear family has totally collapsed as a result of this micromanaging from the left. 
In 1970, 40% of American households were headed by married couples with children. Today, it's only 18%. If you were born into a family to where your dad was married to your mom, I want you this evening to just thank God. I mean, to get on your hands and knees and bless him for allowing you at least that much. And then bless him and ask him to continue to bless your family even in their challenges. Because that number is 18% today. You survived. The single family, in 1970, only 7% of American children lived with a mother who had never married. In 1970, only 7%. So you've grown up in a generation of what that reality looks like today. Only seven, this is not that long ago. And now today that number is 48%. 48%. Birth outside of marriage is just unbelievable and astounding to where we don't even, we're discussing through think tanks like mine how to fix it. Because it's almost unfixable, but by the grace of God. I was with some teachers in Alabama. They were like, oh, you run a think tank? I'm like, yes, I run a think tank. They're like, well, you need to go think about this. I was like, oh, what? They said, because this is what we're hearing from our 14-year-olds when they come back in the classroom with a black eye. And I said, what happened? He said, Mama said, don't bring home a B on the test. Mama said, bring home a baby. And Mama said, if I don't bring home a baby, I got to go under my uncle because I got to have a baby. Dude, that's our society today. Blacks moved from 22% out of wedlock birth rates in the 60s to 72% today. Whites went from 3% in the 60s to 30% today. That's why the pathologies that we thought were confined to our at-risk communities, uh, they're all out in the suburbs and everyone's like, well, maybe it wasn't about race after all. Maybe it is about family and religion. Latinos, there was no data in the 60s. They weren't a special interest group to be politically exploited, but they are today. So we have data today. Their out of wedlock birth rates are at uh, 53%. You know, you might not care. You might say, why does this even matter to me? You know, I, I don't care. I'm libertarian. Well, there are three reasons that we should care as Christians. Okay, one is child poverty. We should care about that. Today, two-thirds of all poor children in America live in a, a single-headed household. Now, we could, you know, we pretend, and in particular, I hear this up from my secular college students, that, well, I care about poverty. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I care about world peace, and I care about animals. Um, and I'm, I really want to um, stop human trafficking. Well, if you want to stop human trafficking, then you would address pornography. And if you're going to address pornography, then you would start addressing family and tradition. Okay, so let's, let's not go there. But let's talk about the poverty part that you pretend that you care about. 8% of children living in married couple households are poor. 33% of children living in single-headed households are poor. 400,000 orphans are in our foster system. You know, when I found out that, I said, there are not 400,000 Christians in this country. What in the world if we have 400,000 orphans at the hand of the state who are now turning them over to homosexual homes? We have 3 million children living in our housing projects, public housing. Poor children struggle in school. They have tremendous difficulties becoming proficient in math and, and reading. In the case of black children, you know, we just came out of school choice week, so I was looking at all the black data. The 2015 NAEP, which is known as our nation's um, education report card, it just saddened me to see those numbers. The math scores, only 17% of black fourth graders uh, and only 11% of black eighth graders are proficient in math. In reading, only 16% of black fourth graders and only 15% of black eighth graders were proficient. And yet there's not one representative on the left that thinks school choice might be a good idea. Not one. Give me one. And I might stop calling them Democrats. Just one. The second reason that we should care as a society is crime. We say we care. But here are the reasons we should care about all of the other things I've talked about, about the collapse in society when you take out religion and you take out traditional family. Conjugal marriage. Child poverty, now crime. Bookshelves are sagging with research that demonstrate with crystal clear clarity that unmarried men are promiscuous men. And promiscuous men produce unproductive men. And unproductive men are often dangerous men. 70% of the youth in our criminal justice system come from single-head households. Now, I know you don't hear that on the news much, and certainly you don't hear it out of a whole lot of leaders of these communities. They want to blame everybody else about why there are there these racial disparities in our criminal system. 70% of the youth in our criminal justice system come from a single-headed household. 95% 
of the men that are in our federal pen have no relationship with their dad. So don't give me this Black Lives Matter. You want to Black Lives Matter it? Then there are two things that you need to be thinking about. One, unionize police officers, and the other, break down a family. You know, Proverbs 17, 6 says that the glory of children is their father. I looked up glory in the dictionary. Majestic beauty, a height of achievement, enjoyment, prosperity, the splendor and bliss of heaven. This is the word, glory, perfect happiness. The glory of children is their father. And yet we've set up laws all across this country to remove the father from the household, to remove the father from decisions on whether he should even marry the woman he just impregnated. That's a good idea, better than her killing him or to remove the father based on the welfare state with rules, don't save, don't work, don't get married. We have women in these housing projects in these Section 8 homes all across this country of three children by the same man, but if he marries her, she gets kicked out. Doesn't sound like interest in the poor to me. And the third societal reason, third and final societal reason in care is just diminish morale. When you think about it, uh, the great society of secular states has had great costs, both the emotional costs, economic costs, and it's taken a toll on all of us as neighbors. It's taken a toll on us. It used, to, it used to be you could just talk about anything, anytime. Now everything is so politically correct, people don't even want to say good morning because it might offend you. It's not so good. I haven't even had my coffee yet. That's how I felt this morning. I'm like, oh, man. Oh, the one thing about some of these hotels now, they put the cheap coffee in the room if they're going to put it in there at all. It's like, I want real coffee. <laughs> but it's taking a toll on us. The federal government takes 25% of our economy now, forcing the public square to be constant battleground of, of, of conflict and hostility. Because the economic costs are high. And people that get up on Sunday morning and go to church, and then Monday morning they get up and go to work, and they send their kids to school and tell them they better behave. And they tell the teacher and report to me if they don't. They get tired of getting to Friday and looking at their paycheck and says, well, how come half the country's not doing this? What, what, what are you guys doing? That's why they sent the tea party out there. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. We, 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 we're, we're, we're in the water. <laughs> we're seeing the beach now. We just don't want to go this way. This is not where we're supposed to be going. What happened? Well, poverty's become really big business. $24 trillion since the war on poverty began. $24 trillion since the war on poverty began. And what's really interesting, God, if we could just at least name one program that works. If we could have at least moved the poverty needle. When they started the war on poverty in the 60s, poverty rate was right about 24% of the population. The poverty rate today is about 25% of the population. It's interesting. It's not the same people, but it sure is the same percentage. If we were looking to, <laughs> we lost that war, that's one we probably should pull out of. The federal government spends $900 billion annually on these anti-poverty programs. We've reached a real dangerous mass of special interests that have now too much stake in big government. Less than 20 cents on a dollar actually reaches the homes that we say we're trying to help. Out of that $900 billion, too many people have too much stake, whether they're employed by it, collecting benefits from it, in business, getting favors from it. In the 60s, 20% of Americans got more than they put in. Today, 60% of Americans got more than they put in. We're, we're arguing the Ag Bill, which is where food stamps is. It's not the welfare mom coming to Washington saying, hey, uh, uh, don't, don't stop my food stamps. No, it's J.P. Morgan's lobbyists because they manage that $90 billion in food stamps. It's craft food because we force the welfare mom to eat cheese, and so it's 10% of their bottom line. This last go around last year, <laughs> it was Amazon Prime because they figured, well, we sell food. We should be able to get the EBT swipe card. It's McDonald's. Well, how come Walmart gets to take the EBT swipe and we can't take it? We sell food. Government dependency seeped in our entire society. So we're not free. We're not emotionally free. We're just no longer free people when judges get to redefine truth. We're not free when politicians can pass laws into every one of our lives. And bureaucrats can segment us into all of these little groups. We have an agency for that. You name the group, we got an agency for that. Based on race, based on gender, based on income, based on assets, based on sexual identification, just a further experiment that we know throughout history has been proven to reduce mankind to savagery. It's not even going to work, all this social experimentation. We know it. 
And we got more agencies out there. So that's why I think this last go around, you know, they decided to keep the government open. And I think it's because the, the, the new pharaoh in town, he probably was getting ready to ask, okay, so what exactly happens when you shut the government? Well, the non-essentials don't get to come to work. Knowing this businessman, he would have said, well, who qualifies for non-essential? Well, people we don't really need. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's why they like, we better, before he's exposed to the fact that he, we don't need a lot of government bureaucrats and says, well, why don't you just fire them? Maybe we better just leave it open one more week. We are just not healthy as a society. But you know what? I think I'm running out of time, but the good, yeah, and, and I've got good news. Yeah, it's not, the, the picture I drew is not healthy. It, I know it isn't. It's just it, out of control debt, enslavement to government, broken families, just not a formula for a great country. But the good news is we can change. The good news is we have changed in the past. The, the, what has stopped is government intrusion has stopped us from changing. The beauty of America is we evolved. That's the beauty of our, of, our, of our history, understanding the fundamentals of Christianity. We know that we don't have to stay the same. So we were moving toward that more perfect union. And every part of our country that's untouched by government is going great. I mean, look at Uber and iPhone. The only reason I still use paper notes is because my five-year-old granddaughter hasn't taught me yet how to keep that light on when I'm talking, and then it keeps going off, and then I have to redial my code to get in and stuff like that. And so, I mean, she, she, when she was three, she downloaded a Mickey app. So, you know, the good news is that that growing gig industry is colorblind. We don't even have to hear all of this racial dynamics anymore about how a taxi won't pick you up in New York. That is so yesterday to even have a cat come get you. Get an Uber app. And frankly, with the Uber app, black sings loud. You just tell them you got a black card? Who Lord. Especially if it's a black American Express? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, American productivity and where things are still really looking good, families intact, it's, it's okay. We're, we're really healthy. I was telling somebody earlier, even when you look at the black-white dynamic, when you have black household, husband married to the mother of the children, and you have white household, husband married to the mother of the children, we can't even measure the economic, the, uh, the, um, the education or the crime differences. They're just, they're, it's just gone. It's just, there's not that gap. The gap comes when people have dysfunction in their lives. The gap comes when we just trap them in ghettos. The gap comes from government. So we've got to change course. We need to change course. And we are changing course. I think I better stop there because I, I forgot what time you told me I need to stop. But I'll tell you what they, well, there are three things that we're doing in Washington that we know is going to change this course. Do I have time to go over those three things? You sure? I'll go through quickly. In fact, I'll just read them so that that way I won't keep going off on tangents and, and people wonder where she's going. Because we're really moving toward them. And I know that these things that we, we are doing will ultimately address those concerns of ethnicity, economics, and identity politics. The first thing we're going to do is end abortion. It's not salvation. We're going to end abortion. And we're going to end it now in your lifetime. I've been working in this area for a long time. And we were getting really weary and well-doing, and we didn't, certainly didn't see a light in that tunnel to say that we'd be able to end this in our lifetime. You know, I had put myself in the shoes of those that went before me in my ancestry and many a times of what they must have been doing through, the, through, through, through slavery. That while they were trying to figure out an answer to the big moral question on the table, then you had amazing heroes like, like Harry Tubman just pulling them out one by one. You had all kind of people doing all kind of work to end it. In 80 years into this new country, and 620,000 dead later, God said, well, I told you it wasn't lawful in my eyes. We're going to end abortion. It's a crime against humanity. And I just got in a lot of serious trouble by a congressman because in the hearings at the, at, in, the, in the Congress, um, you know, I told them, because I was a witness, and uh, so they, I was asked a question, and so I told them how Roe v. Wade and Dred Scott read almost verbatim. You take the titles off and they will read almost exact. And that congressman came unglued, called me, you must be ignorant, oh, you just don't know how to talk to a congressman, ooh, Lord. So that thing went viral, his constituents heard about it, so I'll be in his neighborhood next a uh, couple of days. <laughs> in a couple of days, so, because we need to replace him. He's too invested in abortion. He represents one of the districts that's most hurt in our society. They, you talk about vulnerability, they have the highest infant mortality rate in the country. And he's invested in, in Planned Parenthood to the degree that he thinks, oh, they're salvation. 
he likes partial birth abortion to where the child is on his way out of the womb. And they breach it, take the brain matter out of his head, collapse it, and throw it in the trash. Oh, we just got to get rid of him. Because what's happened, women have lost themselves in this lie of abortion. It, it, it feeds that narrative of victimhood. And as a result, women have forgotten that they actually have control over their sexual impulses. When, you, when women say, no, men marry, then that becomes very easy to fix a whole lot of our social problems if we just have more women saying no, because men will marry you if you say no. And especially if you know how to cook, he'll marry you tomorrow. <laughs> no, it's true. Now, women are the social stabilizers. That's why God put the biological clock there. There are only two places outside of nature where God put time. In the week, out of nature, the week is not in nature. It's for worship. But he put the clock in the woman to stabilize the society. But we knew better. We manipulated the clock. We turned it, abortion into a safety net. And now the African-American community is being hit really, really hard. Five years after Dr. King's death, Roe v. Wade became national law. And the number of black abortions is heart-wrenching. Planned Parenthood founder and eugenicist, the chief eugenicist of them all, would be very proud. 1,400 a day, 40,000 a month, 500,000 a year, 18 million since Roe v. Wade. Is it any wonder that our nation's hardest-hit communities are just drowning in moral madness? We just have to start taking responsibility of our sex lives again. And legal abortion is an, an impediment to this. We're going to end it. Second thing we have to do is block grant all federal welfare programs to the states, including education policy, housing policies, the states where we have to look for ideas on how to move the poor into flexibility, mobility, and prosperity. Poor children more than anyone need help getting out of these government schools and from under this government health care, government housing, government welfare, government wage laws, government retirement. What does the government not control? And enough can't be said about educational options and choice where money should follow children to the schools the parents want. And the third and final thing we have to do is personalize Social Security. There are extremely important reasons to personalize Social Security for poor Americans, in particular for black Americans, especially if we want to heal this divide. Per the Federal Reserve, in 2016, the median black family net worth was $17,600, about 10% of the median white family net worth. 19% of blacks have zero or no net worth. So just the way the money can follow children to the schools the parents want, we should allow retirement funds to go be directed to the IRA if the worker wants. Freedom and ownership is how we're going to heal ourselves and break the cycle of poverty and build on the beautiful diversity and multiculturalism that has made this country so rich. The opportunity to build wealth is one of the most amazing benefits of a free society. So we need to remove all of the barriers that keep people from being able to transfer wealth. So I'm very much pushing that idea in Washington, D.C. And so in closing, you can't change things. This is a quote from Forbes magazine. You can't change things by fighting the existing reality. To change things, you've got to build a new model to make the existing model obsolete. Well, the existing model to help our nation's poor and to unify our country is just not working. So I've committed my life to change that model, make it obsolete, and I pray that you will help me. Thank you.